squat, scorn. This video is sponsored by Squarespace, the number one place to make a website that is effortlessly beautiful as Antoine Dupont on the cover of GQ. And so it falls on England. After three years of near misses in amongst 12 years of slightly more significant ones and two consecutive second place finishes, now only Eddie Jones' gaggle of starters and finishers stand between France and part one of this team's destiny. After Fabio and Gautier's 15 staggered to a win against Wales that both was and wasn't pretty comfortable. It was an odd little game, intensity sky high and rugby often open and free flowing despite the tiny points total and almost none of the usual stats leading to their most frequent outcomes. And it all begs one big question. So how did France close out their penultimate game on their way to the eyed up slam de grand and what do we make of a Welsh team who can dominate a game without ever looking like they might consider dominating on the scoreboard? Because it was an even odder game when looked at from a Welsh point of view. Tactically it felt like Wales won the chess match only for their opponent to stand up and shoot them in the face before the king could be knocked over as Wayne Pivac's team gave the world a very interesting blueprint on how to potentially beat Monsieur Dupont et Copains. And let's start with the friends. This French team's superb attack thrives on giving the halfbacks as many options as possible to overwhelm the defence, but there's a critical stage before they get there. The best attacks France run usually involve a big carry from a three-man pod around-ish the 15 metre mark, enabling the other 12 players to get into shape, and whilst the obvious thing would be looking to disrupt the you know, 12 others, Wales instead focus on disrupting at source, deploying the biggest units in Will Rollins and Josh Navidi to fly out of line and then try and hit that first wave, just roll them using the biggest masses they had before anything could develop. And it blunted the French attack from a deadly point of sword to kind of just like a, like a big stick, like a big, pretty big stick, which can still hurt if it hits you, but it doesn't necessarily kill you. <laughs> But perhaps even smarter was the way Wales taught Antoine Dupont from his friends. Here, France are running a wraparound play to create an extra man, but Jonathan Davis reads it right away and goes in to check Dupont. Now, this opens up a wee bit of extra space outside him, and Villiers can hit the hole and link up, but this play feels designed to put Dupont in place for one of his trademark cheat lines, to run the kind of support line that he does here in any of these examples, and usually leads to a try. And Davis just makes sure that he can't do that. He gambles kind of 30 metres on not letting Dupont get in support, on him not running that line and then gets back to make this brilliant shot on Jaminet. This ball is Messi and other centre Owen Watkins smothers Dupont the moment he picks up the ball. These next two phases by France are relatively quick as they attempt to set as previously discussed but where does the speed and disruption mean that both require three French forwards and leaves Antonio as the only chunk lad in the attack here. Untermac has far fewer options than France would like and Big is able to shoot up on Dante who's picking no line whatsoever offering no real threat whatsoever. He instead calls for Malfana trying to wrap around him to instead run inside the winger tries to Changes line really late, but it's a dumb idea, it's a knock on, and Wales regain the ball. Really good pressure, really good simple defence. But Pivak's big gang of sillies were also far more subtle in how they shut down Dupont. As mentioned, the French team are always looking for that one big carry to set options off for the next phase, and traditionally the line out has been a superb means of setting that. On Friday, however, Wales did a sublime job of spoiling it. Cameron Wokey, who let's forget had never played a top class match at lock until three months ago, was made line out caller for the first time ever on Friday and clearly misunderstood Sean Edwards as French and assumed that meant line out taker, as he called every single line out in the first half to himself, even here throwing his arm on the edge to make it extra obvious, extra easy, and it became incredibly simple for Will Rollins and Wales to disrupt that ball. But when France did win clean ball from the line out, Wales got amongst them so neatly. Here, Fatal flies up to kill his channel and DuPont's options with it, meaning other than getting smashed, the poster boy for power napping has no real option but to invite his number 8 on a neutral carry into a well marked area. But this was even smarter. France have a clear strike move set and I'd wager it's something similar to this one against the All Blacks, shifting from their 1-3-3-1 pattern to a 4-4 pattern that allows the forwards to just flood the same area and eat up cheap easy meters until the opposition pack is really pulled in, until they've really condensed here and they can attack elsewhere. However, Elias stands out and opens a tiny hole up here for Dupont, knowing he's as likely to turn it down as a fluffy dressing gown, but also that Falatau is watching. And, you know, because he's bloody Tully by Falatau, of course he makes the tackle. And suddenly, the French forwards that are beginning to set up for the 4-4 in the middle are just adjusting to something that was completely different. It's, it's, a, it's all over the place, and honestly, it's a bit of a mess. Adam Beard makes a brilliant shot, and it takes a big carry a moment later by Willemser to spark anything going. And then a small, smart block by Wokey allows Dupont the time to put by perfectly into space for another bullock. He offloads to Dante, and France have fastball massive momentum, and a huge overlap on this side. 
the play has worked after all. But Wales have laid a trap. Now, last week I speculated whether Wales were opening gaps for Marcus Smith deliberately because they knew he'd take them, and this week kind of confirmed my theories. Wales presented the only world-class player to ever look like a Funko Pop of himself for the same situation over and over, and he kept falling for it. Spotting a prop here and a gap outside the big lad, Dupont looks to jink and jive and get on the outside to make the break himself. However, since he does this, you know, constantly, does this a lot, you know, there's kind of lots of YouTube videos of him doing this, Thomas is under instruction to just go low and chop him early. Eyes on no one else. Eyes on no other options. They know what he's going to do. Dupont hits the deck and forces the offload. Wales then turn the ball over just a few moments later. We saw it again here. Dupont spying space outside Francis and reckoning he can dance into it. He can make himself make the clean break. But all it does is close off Dupont's own options and allow Navidi to come in here and hit by from the inside and drag him away from his support. Instead of getting isolated, which he probably would have done, he forces an offload and Jalance just does something ludicrous. And it's an easy read for Watkin to cost France 20 metres. If it's, say, Jameson Gibson Park or Ben Young's at nine, the pass is given here and France got the try. If it's Martin Landaggio or Tom Haberfield, France here just continue advancing upfield slowly but surely. There are further examples throughout the game, but the headline is, sometimes Antoine Dupont is too focused on being Antoine Dupont to just be a competent international scrum half. And Wales were able to exploit that and get in his head to the point he's making dumb errors like following up a terrible, really bad attacking set by Wales here with just a cheap offload penalty that gets them out of trouble, just lets them off for the whole thing. In complete contrast to Dupont, however, was Talupi Falatau, the classic silent protagonist who played in imperiously at the weekend and somehow got even better every time I watched this game back. Every time I watch it back, Falatau was better than he was the previous time. However, as an infamously silent man, Falatau is very rarely one to share his thoughts and so found himself last week thinking of all the feelings he had to express and needing an outlet to share them that allowed him to still keep his mouth shut to lupe the side of the head to Squarespace. Squarespace makes it so simple and easy to make a beautiful website in mere minutes that he was up and running with a lovely looking website and able to start an equally lovely blog which supports threaded comments, replies, likes from all his friends to share his thoughts, what he's been up to, what he's eaten lately, without opening his mouth. He set up a members only area to privately talk to his dear dear friends from the Gwent Tongan community and Toby can check comprehensive analytics to see his wholesome little website growing. And if you want to be just like everyone's favourite gentle Welsh Tongan giant, you you too can head to the link in the description and use the offer code Squid Rugby to make your own website and save some money as well at the checkout. It's a really good deal. But frankly, right, Falatau should be able to afford paying full whack if he wants because that man is worth his weight in gold. The regularity with which Wales looked in trouble only for Falatau to just make 10, 20 yards was, always is, staggering. His contributions on or to create the front foot are exceptional and his defensive play was responsible for six of Wales' nine points. His tackle and attempt to jackal, forcing more Farner to seal off is straightforward, just world-class shit. But Wales' first three-pointer comes from subtler work. From the kickoff, Falatau just obliterates this lifting pod, goes straight through the middle and splits them up allowing him to get in clean on Dupont. This throws France off their game massively. All the positioning goes from forwards and backs. Undermack has slot in at 9, Chamonix into 10, and he rushes his kick as a result. It gives Bigger loads of time to place it perfectly into space, which he does. It's an excellent kick. And when Bigger hangs it, the space is empty. But in the meantime, a handful of displaced players have retreated and managed to form a very obvious wall to block Bigger's path. Those players are the exact same guys Falatau skittled through and trapped in the ruck earlier on. Left out of shape, still find their position, when the kick comes down. However, for all the smart ways where we shut down France, Le Bleu still kind of did win the game, and I should probably talk about that. So ultimately, the difference was made by a superb try scored by Anthony Jalanche. Now, if they go on to win the championship, 2022 to France will be remembered as an attacking team who ran everything. But France have actually kicked more often and for more metres than anyone else in the championship. And the discipline of this kicking game is what's allowed them to open things up. And that's now starting to develop its own reputation. After the last few weeks, Wales spent this passage petrified of a 50-22 and marked the wings so heavily, France can just pump it down the middle and continue advancing five metres at a time until eventually Josh Adams puts it out to give France a 30 metre net game. And so it happens again for the try. France make a mess of the scrum, Dupont wanting, waiting for the penalty and ignores Carly's call to use it, and in the end just has to whip it away under huge pressure, and then puts that pressure onto Underback who forces a daffle to Adrit, and France generally a bit of a shambles. However, the difference between this France and France from a few years ago is that they just stop, calm down, set to kick, 
get rid of it. Now, any other team in the world would likely hang a Springbok-style crossfield bomb and look to chase, regather, and gain some momentum, but Jamonet instead hits this pretty long and low. They know Bigger will cover this, but they also know he's on his own, so he's going to kick it back. And France just spread their resource across the backfield really well. There's no realistic space for Bigger to target, so he just looks to find grass to get a bounce to buy some time instead of thinking of kind of longer-term outcome, and it's easily covered by Untermac, who pumps a superb kick right back into the middle. It bounces, and hence allows the French chase longer to get up. Now, Wales will seem under instructions towards kicking to the French half to focus on territory in this game, so Williams hits it way further than he normally would in this kind of situation, and it winds up just a terrible kick that gives Jamine time, resources, and options. So he looks up, sees Dante here attempting to run a block behind Beard and Davis. Beard smartly blocks the block, but Jamine still centers space. However, now, Jonathan Davis does unbelievably well here. Him and Cuthbert kind of invite Jamine into a tiny hole they've opened up deliberately, knowing this will shut down any option except for a forward pass. However, Jamine times it superbly and it looks plausible enough in action that he gets away with the forward pass. It works. Villiers tries the dummy kick thing again, but obviously he isn't getting away with that shit twice in one tournament. And, as per last round, France's forwards have set into shape for the next phase as the break is made, rather than as the ruck is set, and it grants Untermac six options on top of going himself. But, a brilliant bit of defence by Watkin disrupts this. He hides himself behind Antonio, a pretty easy task let's be honest, waits until these two are in front of Untermac, and then cuts off two more, leaving the fly-off with only one runner. Dante is well covered by Williams, but he, well, yeah, he gets, he gets very injured. Just gets very injured. This is going to be relevant later. Dupont sends Cyril by straight into Watkin, who can bring him to ground, but afterwards only can go back and fill in on the wing. It's the only position he's kind of got left he can run into. And as Wokey carries, France sets shape again so well. It's so fluid, so clean. And Untermac has six options once again. Now, we've seen France run this move in the past. They hit the outside forward, who plays behind the back to Dante, who links up with Fiku and Jaminet to create the overlap. However, Jonathan Davis reads this and takes Aldrit man and ball wraps him up. It's a brilliant bit of defence, and Falatau then slows the ball a tad, which gives the Welsh forwards time to fold around the corner. However, it's only the Welsh forwards that fold around. With Watkin on the far wing and Davis at the bottom of the ruck, there's no centre here to organise the defence. Now, this is a situation Wales have got used to in the Six Nations. Because they like to split up their centres in defence, they regularly use Thomas Williams as an extra centre. He essentially fills in to defend the 13 to the actual centre to Tomkins, Davis, or Watkins at 12. Normally, Williams would fill in outside Seb Davis here, Cuthbert can push wider, and this is easy covered. But with Williams missing an arm and looking for his head, there's room for France to exploit. Dante runs a superb line. Once it becomes evident the ball isn't hitting him, he adjusts to just target Gareth Thomas and make a nudge. This prevents the Welsh drift taking out all but Cuthbert and Davis, and essentially turning this from a 6 on 5 to a 4 on 2. And in Test Rugby, a 4 on 2 is pretty much just a formal invitation for a team as skillful as France to do this. Fiku and Jaminet both time it perfectly and Jalant scores in the corner. It's actually very similar to Wales' one real guilt edge chance as they run a very simple three phase play. First phase is just supposed to be fast. Valatel launches and Foxy steps in to clear, meaning the French defence is just kind of in its default shape but condensers move slightly further along, they all kind of shuffle along. And the next phase, Baker can send Josh Adams right between both front centres who are grouped together still here. This takes out both the team's defensive organisers just temporarily out of the game. Malvac, however, slows the ball really well and allows Dante a chance to get back to his feet, but he can't apply any sort of pressure, just kind of filling the space. He hasn't organised anything, so Wales have a huge opportunity. Owen Watkins spots the kickers on, so Bigger pulls it across to Falatau, who tries to flick in field to the Fox, but instead it creates a moment that Davis will spend the next week desperately trying to forget. As ever, Wales' attack only ever needs one good carry to get it going, but actually turning that into points takes quite a lot more. For how smartly Wales played, I never got the sense they were going to win, and very rarely the sense they were going to score any points at all, and that's kind of a huge problem for Wayne Pivak. On the other hand, this is a French team who have learned to take their every opportunity. The second half was dominated by Wales in terms of territory, as they deployed the fact that their entire backline can kick really neatly to excellent effect. Last week I used the phrase, these are territory kicks disguised as attacking kicks, and that kind of describes what Wales are doing here really well, and it kept the pressure on France. Yeah, France's only visit to the World 22 of the third quarter resulted in three points for Jaminet, and the next trip down there, very own resulted in three more for Untermac. France don't mess around at all. It's a classic, really good drop goal drill. And they set it up really nicely, cleanly, and only miss it because Fartal makes such a phenomenal attempt at the charge down, targeting the fly-off's foot and positioning himself directly between Untermax's boot and the post. Meaning if he hits it cleanly, aimed at the middle, it's getting charged down, so he has to hit it slightly to the side to get it away, and ball then drifts slightly to the side as well. This was a vitally important game for France's development as they head towards 2023. They've created blowouts and closed out high-scoring fixtures, but you could feel them learn more and more about how to play when targeted and tactically dismantled as the game went on. 
They came out far more composed after half time, as if they were told to just focus on plan B. And whilst we still had a few silly offloads such as this leading to a knock on by Mavaka, they knew they had to soak up pressure. It was like watching a classic Warren Gatland, Sean Edwards team, a side happy winning without possession. France didn't mind just giving the ball to Wales because they knew they had them defensively. There were no tweaks or changes to the usual defensive system, just extreme, extreme aggression and competence. And as Wales continued blowing chances, enthusiasm and confidence rushed out of the team like air from the blow up to the loop of Faltau Sextor, I definitely don't own. France have the complete package. But to beat a team playing at a pretty high percentage of their ability, as Wales did on Friday night, relying on just one of the attributes within that package, not only shows what a fearsome side they are, but it also serves to make that attribute stronger. They say the sign of a good team is winning whilst playing badly, but when the opposition force you into playing badly and you still win, it's even more impressive. They just managed the final quarter really well. Not just the drop goal attempt that would have killed the game, but Maxime Luku here pins Anscombe in his own 22 and eats time off the clock by forcing the mark to be called. And likewise, Jaminet's shot here noshes on a minute before Anscombe again sends the ball in touch roughly where the lineup would have been if they'd not gone for goal. Whilst Wales' game management? Wokeful. Here, five points down and going backwards inside the 22. Instead of taking a drop goal, Dan Bigger overplays and Roman Undermack intercepts. When Pivac and Stephen Jones plan A, the 1 3 2 2 attack is. Fine, you know, a point to work pretty well. And Owen Watkins really grown into the system. On Friday, we saw him both slot in as a forward here and step in as an alternate playmaker, running this passage really well, timing his passes. But considering how often it isn't working, it feels needlessly stubborn that the Welsh coaches haven't drawn up a real alternative or started looking at drop goals or more conservative rugby as well. This move is perhaps the only twist on tactics we have seen. A fast phase inviting Hardy to hang it deep with Liam Williams as the main chaser, but Owen Watkins really cleverly lingering here so that if there's a tap back by France, he's in position to just dive on the ball and score. But Hardy's kick drifts a little too far to the left, and it makes it a tricky chase for Williams, and in the end, France cover it. I hope this is the start of where was building out more of a game beyond the same 1-3-2-2 attack, and the kicking has been excellent the last couple of weeks, but Friday felt like a match where a team were forced to learn a lesson they've kind of already been taught. France, however, now march on, march on, to Stade de France, ready to face a Grand Slam decider that would give this side experience of playing in a test match final 18 months out from what we're still looking to as their eventual destiny. They got through chapter 4 here in ugly fashion, but the dream remains alive and the team continues to just keep getting better. France now have just a few days until they're face to face with the trophy and only England standing in their way. Thank you for watching that, I hope you enjoyed it. This brings us most of the way through the Six Nations now. The videos on the other games from the penultimate round will be up in the next couple of days as we chug along towards Super Saturday this weekend. I'll see you all there. In the meantime, there's also the podcast if you'll have a look at that. There's you know a bunch of old World Cup games we're covering in detail as well as other stuff around the channel. Please have a look, have a fun around, and I'll see you very soon for more of this here rugby. Oh, and look at that. Well, he is the romantic Romanian, isn't he? Florin Sarugiu.